In Israel, authorities held a conference for planning the establishment of illegal settlements in Gaza and forcing the displacement of Palestinians. In France, Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin announced the deployment of at least 15,000 police officers to deal with the farmers' protests. In Argentina, firefighters face a forest fire that has already affected more than 1,000 hectares in Los Alerces National Park and the other areas in the province of Chubut. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Resus Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Israel, authorities on Sunday held a conference in Tel Aviv with the aim of planning the establishment of illegal settlements in Gaza and forcing the displacement of Palestinians as a solution for Israelis to resettle in the Strip. In this context, Israeli government ministers and members of parliament participated in the so-called Return to Gaza meeting. In this context, the far-right Israeli Minister of National Security, Itamar ben Gvir, called for the voluntary migration of the Palestinians and the renewal of the Israeli settlements in the Gaza Strip. For his part, he proposed that the Palestinians in Gaza should go to Iraq, Qatar, and, or Turkey. At the same time, Israeli minister added that the voluntary transfer of Gaza is the solution. In these regards, Daniela Weiss, Israeli settlement movement leader in the framework of the conference to call for the re-establishment of Jewish settlements in the Gaza Strip, defended the Zionist policy of occupation and genocide of forcing massive displacement of Palestinians, a policy rejected by the international community and the United Nations. The aim of this assembly is to bring together the people who claim that we have to return to the Gaza Strip and establish Jewish communities right away. In the Gush Katif area, in the city of Gaza itself, and all over the Strip, the Arabs will not stay in Gaza, not the Hamas, not the supporters of Hamas. And those who do not support Hamas don't want to stay anyway. So the purpose is to uh, impose pressure on the government by masses, by the, the, there is this gathering, there will be another gathering and another gathering, a bigger one. The Palestinian government condemned on Monday a conference held in Israel with the presence of 11 ministers and 15 legislators to address the expulsion of the population of Gaza and repopulate the area with Jewish settlers. In this sense, the Palestinian authorities say that the aim of the event held in Tel Aviv reveals the true face of the Israeli far-right in power, its hostility to peace and its adherence to occupation, colonialism and apartheid. In the meantime, the statement added they hold responsible Benjamin Netanyahu's government directly for incentivizing, incentivizing hate and forcing mass displacement. On the other hand, Palestine once again called on the international community and especially the United States to exert real pressure on Netanyahu to stop these provocative practices. And at least 26,637 Palestinians have been killed in Israeli attacks since October 7th, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health's most recent official toll. The ministry announced that the number of Palestinians killed by Israel's genocidal war on the Gaza Strip has risen to 26,637. On the 115th day of the war on Gaza, the Zionist regime committed 14 crimes in different areas of Gaza in the past 24 hours, killing 215 people and injuring 300. Palestinian ministry said in a statement. The Israeli regime has lashed out by air, sea and land against the population of the Gaza Strip on October 7th after suffering an unprecedented defeat in the operation of the Palestinian Islamic resistance movement, Hamas, called Al-Aqsa Flood. In Palestine, local media highlight that on Monday, dozens of civilians were killed by Israeli bombardments on the Gaza Strip in the 115th day of the total siege on the population. In this regard, during the early hours, several people were killed by bombs dropped on five houses in the neighborhood of Rimal in the northern city of Gaza. In addition, according to the Wafa News Agency, 10 people also were killed after an Israeli attack on a school run by the United Nations Refugee Agency. 
Meanwhile, the military continued the siege for the eighth day of the Nasser and Al Amal hospitals, located in the southern city of Han Yunis, epicenter of the Israeli ground offensive. And more than 60 Palestinian journalists have been imprisoned by Israel since the beginning of the bombardment of Gaza on October 7th. 61 Palestinian journalists are being held in Israeli jails. 15 were arrested in the first eight months of 2023 and another 46 after the beginning of the total siege of Gaza. Most of those arrested are from the occupied West Bank and most of them are under administrative arrest, a measure by which Israel arrests without formal charges or to a trial date, so it is not known whether imprisonment will end. According to the Union of Palestinian Journalists, Israel is implementing a campaign of repression against journalists who seek to report on the situation in the Gaza Strip. In South Africa, activists and press workers held a vigil in solidarity with Palestinian journalists. Around 200 people participated in the activity on Sunday afternoon in front of the St. George Cathedral in Cape Town. The people lighted candles in honor of the journalists killed by Israel in the Gaza Strip and placed posters with their faces on the outside of the cathedral. The Palestinian Journalists Union reported that since last October 7th, Israel has killed 113 journalists and media workers. Similar vigils were held in Johannesburg, Makanda and Durban. None of us here are actually telling the Palestinian stories because we can't. We are too far away. We are relying on our colleagues in Gaza and our colleagues closer to the conflict to tell that story. What we can do is support the endeavor. What we can do is ensure that our the language we use in our in the in the telling of the story by our newsrooms is accurate, and that we stand in solidarity when they are targeted. That's what we can do. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesol English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. In Niger, hundreds of people took to the streets in celebration of the announcement of withdrawal of Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger from ECOWAS. On Sunday, the leaders of the three Sahel nations issued a statement in which they affirmed that ECOWAS had become a threat to the states and that the withdrawal was a sovereign decision. In the face of these decisions, citizens of Niger celebrated the decision to leave ECOWAS, which they described as an instrument at the service of the French Empire. During the last few months, the three nations have strengthened their mutual cooperation and their positions in favor of the Alliance of Sahel States, which was formed with the objective of reinforcing military assistance against possible cases of aggression or armed rebellion. We are here because it is a request from the people of the Sahel States to sanction ECOWAS, which originally set out to be an ECOWAS of the peoples but which turned out to be an instrument in the service of French imperialism. We are free from this ECOWAS to hell with their sanctions and we consider that from now on there will be bilateral agreements with other states. So it is over with this satanic structure which wants to suffocate the Nigerian people or the people of the Sahel because they have decided to leave French imperialism, the French joke. The governments of Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso announced on Sunday as reported their exit from the economic community of West African states. They said the organization is under the influence of foreign powers, has betrayed its founding principles and has become a threat to its member states. Your Excellencies, the Captain Ibrahim Traoré. Your Excellencies, Head of a State of Burkina Faso, of the Republic of Mali and of the Republic of Niger, will assume with full responsibility to history and we respond to the expectation, to the concerns and aspiration of their populations who have decided in full sovereignty to withdraw Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger from the economic community of West African states. 
without delay. Sign in Oagadongu, Bamako, and Niamey on 28th January 2024. Thank you for your kind attention. 47 people were detained by Turkey security forces on Sunday for being involved in the raid on Santa Maria Catholic Church in Istanbul that left one person dead. According to the Prime Minister Ali Yerlikaya, the Turkish security forces arrested the suspects of the shooting. The authority emphasized that two of those involved are of foreign nationality, specifically one from Tajikistan and another one from Russia, and they would be affiliated to the terrorist group Daesh. The governor of Istanbul, Tavut Gul, described the incident as a heinous attack, informed that the mortal victim was 52 years old and that besides him there were no more wounded. At 22 hours, but murdered suspects were caught during a raid at their specified address. I would like to point out that the both suspects are foreign citizens. We believe that these two foreign citizens, one from Tajikistan and the other from Russia, are members of Daesh, the Islamic State. In France, Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin announced the deployment of at least 15,000 police officers to deal with the farmers' protests. The forces will be strategically placed in different points of conflict, with it is foreseen that demonstrators will carry out blockades starting this Monday. According to local media, this Sunday, a preventive deployment of police officers was carried out in the vicinity of the international market of Rungis, the largest agricultural products market in Europe. At the heart of the farmers' discontent are low wages, inequalities in income distribution, the impact of inflation, bureaucracy and European environmental standards, which they describe as too severe. And in the context of the farmers' strike early in Monday, some 30 Greenpeace activists unfurled a banner in support of the farmers and lit smoke bombs on the Concord Bridge in Paris before being evacuated by police officers. In this sense, Greenpeace France Director General Jean-Francois Julliard called on the government not to fight the wrong battle by attacking environmental standards. Farmers need healthy soils, they need clean and accessible water, they need a climate that doesn't change too, too fast, added the environmental leader. Also in France on Monday in the city of Marseille, local media highlighted that taxis are blocking the freeway known as A50 in the direction of the city centre as part of a series of operations taking place on several major roads in Paris. Marseille and Bordeaux in protest against the patient carpooling health insurance bill. In this respect, the mobilizations aim to obtain negotiation of French health insurance patient transport conditions. In this way, traffic authorities in the Paris area reported that the protests had caused traffic jams on several major roads in the direction of the capital. Otherwise, authorities elsewhere in the country also reported disruptions and advised road users to switch to public transport if possible. And a group of Belgian farmers blocked roads Monday in the city of La Hague, demanding better protections for the agricultural industry. Farmers in several EU countries have been putting pressure on their governments to respond to their demands for better remuneration for their products, less red tape and protection against cheap imports. Clement Glorio, a young farmer from Tournai, said our message is just a message of being fed up general feeling of being fed up at some point rules and constraints are imposed on them whether administrative or financial for a while this has become very penalizing. In Argentina, firefighters face a forest fire that has already affected more than a thousand hectares in Los Alerces National Park and other areas in the province of Chubut. More than 250 firefighters who will be joined by another 123 in the next hours are fighting the fire that broke out on Thursday. Mario Cárdenas, head of the Fire Communications and Emergencies Department of the park, reported that the fire is still active in all its sectors and that weather conditions are unfavorable due to high temperatures and strong winds. Authorities reported that they have the support of two water planes, an observer plane, and two helicopters to face the fire. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience. 
You can scan the QR code on screen to join us directly and share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin America and the Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Found your break, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. On Monday, social organizations in Argentina announced they will establish a plan to demand measures against the lack of food that is hitting the South American nation. In this sense, the Union of Workers of the Popular Economy states they will participate in a, in a national day of protest on Thursday. Mobilizations aim to denounce the lack of food in soup kitchens and the effects of an adjustment plan of the government of Javier Milei that implied a 118% devaluation the elimination of subsidies, the dismissal of personnel of state entities, and the end of public works. The day of protest will include mobilizations to supermarkets, claims to the coordinator of food products, industries, popular suppliers, and delivery of petitions to government agencies. Among the organizations that will be represented are the Evita movement, the movement Somos Barrios de Pie, among others. Brazil rescued 3,190 people in conditions analogous to slavery in 2023. It is the highest number registered in the South American giant since 2009. The data were disclosed by the General Coordinator, Coordination of Inspection for the Eradication of Slave-like Labor and Human Trafficking of the Ministry of Labor and Employment. They revealed that their releases occurred in 598 operations. The report reveals that the employers described paid Discover paid 12.8 million reais, 2 million 500,000 dollars in labor indemnities. The productive properties in which most were rescued are linked to the cultivation of coffee, sugarcane, cleaning services, and land preparation, respectively. The statistics were released on the National Day of Fight Against Slave Labor, which is commemorated every January 28th. In El Salvador, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal informed that Salvadorans abroad only cast 136,842 votes for president. The figure exceeds the total of four members of the Legislative Assembly. According to the electoral entity, the figure is the result of a total of more than 741,000 that can vote electronically, a process that began on January 6 and most closed in a week on February 4. The information was confirmed by the president of that institution, Dora Martinez, in a conference on the results of the second national electoral simulation carried out on Sunday. According to observers, the voters could influence in the re-establishment of the balance of power stipulated in the Constitution, which was violated by some actions undertaken during the last two years from the legislative, which is controlled by the majority of the News Ideas Party. Foreign ministers and representatives of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations are meeting on Monday in the Laos People's Democratic Republic. The delegates were received by the Prime Minister of Laos to later begin the meeting held in the city of Luang Prabang. Among the guests was the presence of the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Myanmar, a country that had not sent anyone to this meeting since the February 2021 coup due to the veto of the military junta. Founded in 1967, Asia is made up of Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and Myanmar. Russia's Central Election Commission registered current president Vladimir Putin as a candidate for the presidency to run in the elections in March. President Putin will run for re-election for a fifth term at the head of the Kremlin. He has been elected president four times in the years 2000, 2004, 2012, and 2018. And after the approval of amendments to the Constitution, he obtained the right to run in this year's elections. The Central Election Commission also registered representatives of three parliamentary parties, which are the LDPR, New People, and the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. North Korea's lead Leader Kim Jong-un supervised on Sunday the test launch of two Pulwasal 331 strategic cruise missiles. The head of state expressed his satisfaction with the results of the test, 
stressing that the current international situation urged the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to strengthen its strategies to defend the country's sovereignty. He also affirmed that the military and armament achievements are of strategic importance for carrying out the Army's modernization plans. According to official media, the tests were carried out without any impact on the security of any neighboring country. On Monday, the South Korean government announced the deployment of two new radiation detectors at the headquarters of the Garak Agriculture and Fish Wholesale Market, the largest in the South Korean capital. The move is part of efforts to dispel public concerns about the release of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan into the ocean. Hyperpure germanium detectors, also known as HPG gamma ray spectroscopy, are a precision device that checks the radiation levels of a product over three hours. Seoul also plans to set up a laboratory for comprehensive radiation inspection in equipped with a pre-treatment facility and will hire more professionals to ensure food safety. Iran and Pakistan reaffirmed collaboration in the fight against terrorism on their borders during the Iranian foreign minister's visit to Islamabad. Iranian Foreign Minister Hussein Amin Abdullahian met with his Pakistani counterpart Jalil Abbas Dilani to discuss security issues with a view to easing bilateral tensions due to the activity of armed groups in their territories. In this regard, the Iranian diplomat stated that Pakistan and Iran will never allow terrorists to harm the relations and security of their borders. For his part, the Pakistani Foreign Minister highlighted the historic ties that unite both nations. His visit at such a short notice testifies to deep commitment of both sides to further strengthen and solidify the fraternal ties between Pakistan and Iran. It's a relationship which is steeped in shared religion, history, culture and geography. And this is a relationship which is also underpinned by strong bond, bonds of amity and brotherhood. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telestoryenglish.net. You can also join us on our social media on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telestory English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.